Welcome, students. This is my second attempt at the video for this week because for some inexplicable reason, inexplicable to me because of my technological capacities and incapacities, the sound on the first video did not work. So I am in a hotel room <laughs> in another state where I am about to speak at a Christian college tomorrow, and I don't have my notes with me, so you won't get the level of detail that you would have gotten otherwise uh, in the video where the sound didn't work, but you will get a framework for understanding this very complex and controversial category that we call the sweat category, which is essentially the category of immigrants who come to a new country in order to work. Now, this category includes immigrants that come to work temporarily as guest workers, immigrants who come to work but are never allowed to integrate fully into the society and immigrants that integrate into the new society. All of those fit into this category of sweat. It is a very common category all around the world for immigration. So I said that the category was controversial. The controversy is under what has to do with under what condition immigrants who come to work benefit the receiving society, the sending society, and the migrants themselves. So let's first look at the area of immigrant contributions. And I want to start with the data that is most commonly accepted. And then I will move down from there to some of the areas where the data is more contested. So it's generally agreed that Overall, immigrants that come to work benefit the receiving society because adding labor grows the economy of the society, particularly in the context of a labor shortage. In a number of developed countries, the birth-death ratio means that you have serious economic problems if you don't have an ongoing influx of young, strong immigrant labor. Now, there is a particular need for low cost labor uh, to keep down the cost of essential products. So that's why the US, for example, has always imported so much farm labor to keep down the cost of food. And it's not that native people can't do that work, it's that native people are less motivated to do the work because it is low paying and the conditions are difficult and often risky. And for someone coming from a country where they could earn much less, what they can earn doing that work in this country feels like a sufficient amount. They're motivated and therefore they're highly productive. So of course that begs the question about whether we should be paying more to, in order to have native workers, but that would impact the overall economy of the society by raising the cost of essential products. Immigrants are clearly also a contribution to the extent that they bring complementary skills. So in the United States, we have an ongoing shortage of nurses that most US citizens do not want to be nurses or certainly not as many as we need. So in the Philippines, we have an abundance of nurses. So we have quite a few Filipina nurses in the United States. We also don't invest in STEM education at the level which would produce enough people for the tech workers that we need. So obviously we need more tech workers from other countries. Although of course some of them stay in other countries, which is another subject that we're going to get to in a few minutes. And can, they work in the US, they work for US companies, but they're in other countries. We're going to get to that. Um, now we come to a category which is more controversial. It is very clear that there is a higher percentage of immigrants who become entrepreneurs. And um, that's pretty much across the board. It has something to do with the drive and courage that it takes to immigrate. Um, you have to be willing to take risks in order to immigrate. And apparently you take risks also to become an entrepreneur. Whether or not uh, innovators, there's a higher level of innovators is contested. There are studies that show that um, more immigrants are innovators. And there are of course, 
a number of individual examples, but some of those studies are contested. But people do agree overall that immigrants bring economic growth. The question is the contributions versus the cost. And we're going to look at that from a couple of angles. First, there, the ratio is different at different levels of society. So again, I'm going to use the United States as a case study. At a federal level, immigrants pay way more into the system than they get from it. Even when Philip Martin wrote in 2017, there were far, immigrants at a federal level paid far more than the services that were actually available to them and the services available to them have been restricted every year. So Obamacare, for example, our national health care system is not available to legal immigrants. And there are a variety of programs that are available, but not for five years. So you have to be, you can be a legal immigrant for five years and not have access to basically any federal services. Now, even for undocumented people, this same situation holds. Most undocumented laborers or workers work with false social security numbers. Now, the US government knows that. There's a special fund where the money from those social, false social security numbers that's taken out of people's paychecks is placed. It's about $12 billion a year. <laughs> And those workers will never be eligible to receive the funds that were taken out of their paychecks since they were using false social security numbers. And so all of that goes into our social security system to keep it solvent. Uh, there's also a phenomena where you can get a small business tax identification number without a social security number. So there are substantial numbers of undocumented immigrants who start small businesses and pay taxes. They get the small business ID number and they pay taxes. Um, and they are treated very differently. In the response to COVID by the US government, small businesses were able to get forgivable loans. But not only could people with an EIN and without an SSN not be, not only were they not eligible for those loans, if they were married to a citizen, that citizen was also not eligible for those loans. Anybody in their family who was a citizen was not eligible for those loans. If there was someone who had a, a business tax ID, but not a social security number. So we treat them very differently. Um, so that's a federal level. So way over balance of what immigrants pay into the system than what they get in the, in the, in the area of services. On a state level, it's much more even because the states pay for the majority of the cost of education and immigrants skew young. However, education can be seen as an investment, particularly if those young immigrants are going to stay in the society and become part of the society, education becomes an investment. But that's still, if you just look at it as taxes versus services, that on a state level, it's about equal. On a local level, immigrants cost more than they pay in because of the cost of health care and particularly when there are not health care clinics that receive immigrants who are undocumented they wait to receive health care until they have to go to an emergency room and that is the most expensive form of care so interestingly the states that offer more services to immigrants obviously have more of a deficit at a state level than the states that don't but um, if that service is in the form of healthcare clinics that allow them not to go to emergency rooms, that's actually a benefit overall to the state. Of course, immigrants pay sales taxes. And what we notice, if you take, again, the measurement question always surfaces when you're doing research. What are you measuring? If you're measuring the ratio as a snapshot, when someone first arrives as an immigrant, you get one picture. If you're measuring the ratio after they've been in the country for many years, you get another picture. And if you're looking at what their children pay in taxes, you get another picture because children of immigrants consistently pay higher taxes than native born. So let's look at another area of contributions versus cost. Really wide agreement that immigrants whose work is complementary contribute to the receiving society. When their work is competitive, that is a cost for the receiving society. 
But the question is, what work is competitive and what work is complementary? And part of what makes that such a confusing area to tackle is that migrant life is fluid. It doesn't hold still. So migrants change jobs. They may change from a job that is competitive to a job that is complementary. Um, they change in other ways as well. I was talking about the story of Pastor Noe Carias. Part of his story is that he went from being an unbeliever to being a Pentecostal pastor. Well, there is research that shows that Pentecostals prosper economically at a higher rate than other people do. Now, there are a variety of reasons for that. But so not only can you expect that Noe coming, becoming a Pentecostal would prosper at a higher rate, but he, as a pastor, he also influences other people to share the same values that allow Pentecostals to prosper and contribute to the society at a higher rate. So how do you measure that? Then in mixed status families, mixed status means that you have members of families that are at different, have different immigration statuses. So you have a citizen married to a non-citizen. That's a mixed status family, right? So mixed status families, you may have people that are complementary and people that are competitive. If you're looking at the household unit, and remember we talked about that, um, immigration theory looks at that, like what is the unit? Is it the individual? Is it the household? If you look at the household unit, you get a very different picture than if you look at the individual. And then we also have the phenomena of people going back to their home countries if conditions improve at home. So in 2018, the net immigration in relationship to the US and Mexico, the net immigration from Mexico was zero because Mexico was doing very well financially and there were more people, there were so many people going back that the numbers of people coming and the number of people going back meant that it was net zero immigration from Mexico. So, um, so you know, how do you look at the question of um, returning migrants as you look at the contributions versus costs? Now, one of the reasons why, or because this is a difficult area to measure, people often look at case studies and Martin um, uses certain case studies. I want to give you some information about one of his case studies that he doesn't include, which changes the picture in important ways. And I want to give you another case study that gives a very different picture than the case studies that he gave. So he talks about the case study of justice for janitors, where the um, industry, particularly the commercial industry that uses janitors, instead of hiring janitors directly, which is the system that they used when most janitors were African-American, they began hiring janitorial companies that then hired immigrants and the wages and benefits of janitors went down significantly. And some of that is because when you have that kind of a third party system, you have a competitive bidding process. So the big commercial building owners could get the lowest bid, which meant that the janitors would be paid very little instead of janitors being unionized and having these large um, regional contracts. Well, Justice for Janitors was a campaign that organized janitors, including migrant janitors who were working for these janitorial companies and organized them successfully. And Martin notes that individual contracts were then gained, um, but that there wasn't a standardized contra contract, which he's right about. But what he doesn't note is that the overall income of a janitor doubled when that organizing happened in the Los Angeles, in the Southern California region. So even though there wasn't a standard contract that covered everyone, there were so many individual contracts that the income of janitors doubled <laughs> and that benefits were corresponding. So, you know, you have to look at all the aspects of a case study. Um, and then there's a very interesting case study in the hotel industry that not only have I read about, but I was also part of the process of observing. So, um, at the same time as the janitorial industry began hiring immigrant labor, um, really with the intent, I believe, of breaking the unions and paying people less, they went from African-American labor to immigrant labor. And Martin is right that the initial response of the unions was to try to, to, to work for more restrictive immigration policies and stronger immigration enforcement. 
However, there was a change during the 90s and first decade of the 2000s in the immigrant population that initially the immigrant population was primarily Mexican and Mexico is a country that does not have a strong union movement. The union move, unions in Mexico are often what they call yellow unions. They work closely with the government. They do very little for people. But um, in the 90s, we had a very large influx of people who were running from the civil wars in Central America. And many of those folks were activists and they were used to suffering for justice sake. And so the hotel workers um, union recognized that and began intentionally to organize those migrant workers side by side with the African-American workers that were left. And that was very effective and had the same result as we saw in the janitorial industry, which is that the overall wages and benefits of um, the hotel workers went up. And I, I think about a um, long time hotel worker, African-American, who said, you know, we thought that the immigrants were the enemy. Well, we began to see that it wasn't the immigrants who were our opponent, it was the people who were hiring them. And then we worked together to hold them accountable to gain higher wages and benefits for us all. So this is an extremely complex area of, of when immigrants are competitive, when they're complementary, and what we should do about it. Now I want to give you a framework for Massey's core argument, which is that if we really want to look at economic costs and benefits, that we can't only look at the individual unit, unit or the individual household, that we really need to look at more complex systems that occur between specific countries. And I love this particular quote. If one does not understand how a complicated piece of machinery works, one should not try to fix it. That's Massey. What does he mean by that? Well, his, the book that you're reading, Smoke and Mirrors, of course, is a book about the longstanding relationship between United States, the United States and Mexico, which also in many ways includes Canada. So how does, what are the components of the system? What are the machine parts that make up this system? Well, first of all, um, historically, U.S. businesses use immigrant labor from Mexico as needed. So as Richard Land of the Southern Baptist says, we give immigrants a double message from Mexico because with one hand we say come here and with the other hand we say go away because we ask them to come here at times when we need them and then we ask them to go away at times when we don't, that immigrants from Mexico work as an economic safety valve for the United States. And of course, this, can, this happens in other adjacent countries as well around the world. I'm just focusing in on the case study of the US and Mexico. Um, the second component is then naturally government policies support business through temporary guest worker programs. And sometimes the government is directly involved in the solicitation of guest workers from Mexico when there's a very widespread social need for Mexican labor. Trade agreements, another component, increase interchanges, which then lead to increased relationships, which leads to increased migration. Massey also notes that as the machine has been tinkered with uh, for reasons other than the actual benefit to the receiving country, the sending country, or the migrants, um, that what happens is that migration increases. So he, he notes that the amnesty that took place in 1986 actually served to increase migration through the family migration category that when people who were here were able to obtain legal papers, that they then obviously immigrated their families. So it did increase immigration on that level, but the other level on which immigration has been increased is that when policies become more restrictive, you stop the natural flow back and forth of migrants who would come to work and then naturally go home to their home country because they can't come back if they go home to their own country. So that results in more migrants staying in the United States and becoming permanent immigrants. 
Um, then he also notes that there's an enormous cost to enforcement, cost to the society and cost to the migrants, cost to the receiving country and cost to the migrants. And that a that cost of enforcement has just continued to multiply by leaps and bounds every year. He suggests as a solution, a managed labor system that is realistic, that recognizes the unique relationship between the United States and Mexico. What's interesting is that Canada has a managed labor migration system. They use a point system. They use computer technology to estimate their economic needs for migrants. And they have roughly the same percentage of farm workers for their size as the US does, but virtually all of them have legal status because of this system, because the system analyzes their needs for farm labor and then provides visas accordingly. Some of them are guest workers and some of them are permanent workers. I also just want to mention, um, realize that I did not make a slide for this, but I do want to talk about the mixed impact on sending countries, that there certainly is a drain on sending countries when labor leaves and when skilled labor leaves. That skilled labor um, is sometimes needed by home countries and are needed by the sending countries, right? But they end up going to the receiving countries in a way that damages the sending country. On the other hand, there's uh, they typically send money home and the money that they send home um, actually supports the economy in highly significant ways of their home country. And so that allows for more people to be educated in their home country who can then take roles of leadership in their home country. Um, so between the brain drain, the labor drain, and the money that's sent back home, um, it's a highly debated question whether the overall impact or when the overall impact on the sending country is positive or negative. And of course, the impact on the migrants themselves um, differs from migrant to migrant. So I hope that I've been able to frame some of the wealth of information that you've been reading this week. And I look forward as always to your reflections. I hope you can hear this.